We talked about this in the Sunday school hour, not the message that I'm preaching, but we went through this chapter. Uh, there's so much that, you know, when I, what I covered this morning at 10 o'clock was not in great detail, uh, but it is, I just basically covered this, the passages here. So today, what I want you to think about is, you know, the Bible in the context of this chapter says we are his workmanship in the sense that those who know Christ as Savior, that God's still working on you, and he's trying to work on you. You get saved, that's settled, amen. You come to Christ, you put your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross, amen. That settles your, your eternal destiny of your soul. You're going to heaven. You can't change it, you're on your way to heaven, amen. But for God also wants to continue working in your life. Are you letting him work in your life today? Or is there something in your life that's hindering the Holy Spirit and the work of God to, to take place in your life? What is going on in your life today? And so he mentions that, and he talks about, as, we, as Brother Hazen just read, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you're not saved by works. Right. Amen? You're, no, one, no one in heaven's comparing their works with each other. No, we're all talking about Jesus. He's the one who saved our soul. There's not one person in heaven, in heaven right now, that is saying, I am been saved by the works, my good old works here. No, people are saved by the grace of God. Grace through faith, the Bible says. And then he says, for we are his workmanship. So God wants to work on you. Amen. But let me, let me kind of bring some other thoughts out of this thought about work and the works. The Bible not only says that we are his workmanship, but God also says in the Old Testament that we are the work of his hands. God said that we, he created man in that garden. How did he create him? Amen. He created him with the dust of the earth. How did he create the woman? After he took man and put him in the garden, gave him responsibilities before the fall of man, work did not come as a result of the fall. It was already in place before he told him to, to dress and keep the garden. He had responsibilities. And then he says it's good for man not to be alone. There are exceptions. 1 Corinthians 7 talks about it, that there are some men, some women, who can keep themselves holy and pure and give all of their time and energy, talents and treasures to Jesus Christ and serve in ministry, serve in a mission work, serve in whatever God's called them to. There's some that can, and there is, the Bible says, even 1 Corinthians 7, it's for some of those, it's good to be that way. But not everybody has that calling. Most people on planet Earth, you need a spouse. Amen? That's just reality. We, you know, God made us social creatures. We need each other. We need friendships. We need relationships. And so God created uh, Eve from Adam's rib. That's what God did. Amen. And we have the first example in the, in the beginning of the Bible of anesthetics, where God puts Adam to sleep and, uh, and takes that rib out, does the surgery, and closes him up, and then makes a woman from that rib. And so, so God made with his hands... You know, we are, we are today, amen, his workmanship. We are the work of his hands today. And what God wants to do, as you'll see today, that God wants to work in your life in four different ways. He works in you, number one, to save you. Number two, he'll work through you when he sends you. That's where we give the gospel out. We share the word of God with people. Number three, God works on you when he sanctifies you. And number four, God works for us when he sees us. And we'll get to all those four things. So let's look at the first one, and it's in this chapter, as we've already said, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath uh, before ordained that we should walk in them. In Philippians chapter of Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, you got Galatians, Ephesians, the next book. Keep your place in Ephesians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 1. The Bible says this. Being confident, verse 6 of Philippians 1, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing. So if God says you can have confidence, you have confidence. You can trust God. Amen. There's things out in the world today you can't trust. 
You know, no, for years there, we, you know, we saw all this stuff, you know, supposedly fake news or this and that. You can't trust some things that aren't on the Internet. It's amazing what you can do with Photoshop, like I told the guys. Man, there's things you can do on videos. You can do so many things to make people think something's happening when it's not. Amen? And so, anyway, but he says this, you can be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work, so God began a good work in your heart when you got saved. Amen? That's what he did. He began a good work in you. And he says this, that he that which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will do that. You know, God, Jesus Christ, God never, never, ever leaves anything undone. Amen? He finishes what he starts. He, Jesus Christ, as I mentioned in the Sunday school hour, Jesus Christ finished his mission on earth when he said on the cross, finally, it is finished. It was finished. It was done. It was settled. Praise God. Amen. He did. He, he culminated 4,000 years of history from the garden, the Bible says, and in and, and the promise of a Messiah, the promise of a Redeemer in Genesis 3.15. That was culminated on that one day and all the other prophecies that you read through the Old Testament. Amen? It was Jesus. It was pointing to Jesus. And he completed that. Praise God for that today. Amen? So the first thing I want you to see here, look at this. And look at 2 Corinthians 1. We'll keep your place in Ephesians 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll do a little back and forth in your Bible. Amen. That's, this helps you get to learn. Where are these books in your Bible? Is it like the kids did on, on, on Thursday? Old Testament or New Testament? And they had the poll. And they had to stand one side for new and the other side for old. And some kids might have got a little confused. Oh, wait a minute. And some of them put their legs on both sides. No, no. You got to make up your mind. Amen. Old or new, old or new, amen? So maybe we should try that with the adults. No, I wouldn't do embarrass you. That's all right. I won't do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And look at your, uh, just give me a minute here. And look at, oh, let's see here, verse 9. The Bible says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves. Boy, I'll tell you, we can park there for a while. Talk about self-trust and everything focused about self. Listen, listen, don't trust in yourself. The Bible even tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is wicked and des desperately wicked. He says it's evil. Amen. The Bible even says in that passage in Jeremiah 17, 9, that we, who can know it? You don't even know your own heart and where it can lead you. Amen. Why do you trust in self? That's what the world's message is. Trust in yourself. Trust in yourself. No, you don't trust. You trust in God. You trust in his word. You trust in his plan. Amen. And then he says here, so he says that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. Verse 10, three things happen. One is past tense, the other is present, and the other is future. First tense, who delivered us from so great a death. Aren't you glad he delivered you from hell? If you're honest with yourself, listen, if you're saved, you under, you, hopefully you understand this. He delivered you for, from a place called hell. Listen, I deserve to go there, but Christ took my place, paid for my sins. I turned to Jesus Christ. I received the gift of eternal life. And God says, praise God, I will not go to that place. I'm going to spend eternity with the Lord in heaven. If you're saved, you'll meet Brother Osteen in heaven. Amen. Whether he's gone yet or not, if he's absent from the body, he's there to be absent from the body. He's present with the Lord. The spirit and the soul is gone. Amen. That's what happens. So he says he delivered us. So that's, we, we listen, we've been delivered from sin's penalty because of Jesus. Not because of how good I was or am. It's because of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Amen. Sin's penalty. Oh, praise God. But not only that, some of us fail to realize that after you're saved, God gives, puts within you the power and ability to overcome sin's power in your life, in the flesh. We struggle. We struggle with things. 
You know, we got stuff coming at from every angle on, on screens and stuff and at the workplace and everywhere you go, you got billboards, you got malls, you got everything that's going on and something to take your heart and mind away from God, to push it away from God. Amen. But you know what God said? God says we have been, listen, he has saved us from the power of sin in our life and he wants to do a work in us. Are you letting him work in your heart and your life? Say, when, how does that work? Well, the more you feed the flesh. And when I say the flesh, I'm not meaning of eating food. Please, eat food, okay? And, uh, but we're talking about feeding the flesh with the things of this world, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those things, we're feeding the flesh. And as a result, we're not strong in the spirit. Amen. We're weak in the spirit when we should be strong in the spirit of God. And we got to be, be careful. So then he says, so the past was he delivered us, verse 10, from so great a death. The present, he doth deliver. Amen. In whom we trust. He's doing it right now for you as a believer if you're saved today. And then he says this, last of all, future tense. And trust that he will yet deliver us. Oh, boy. I can't wait for that deliverance. Romans 8 talks about the fact that, listen, we're waiting for the redemption of uh, uh, redemption to wit our bodies. Listen, no more struggle with the flesh when, the, hey, we get that new body. When is that going to happen, Pastor? When the rapture takes place. When the Lord calls his bride, his church home. Amen. Thank God for that. Those who are dead in Christ, their spirit and souls with the Lord in heaven, but their body's still in the grave. And someday there's going to be a groundbreaking and that ground's going to break up and God's going to resurrect all the dead in Christ. And we're going to rise up. And while we're going up with the dead in Christ, those who are saved have their bodies transformed. God's going to reunite the soul and spirit of those, those corpses. And he's going to make them new and you're going to have glorified bodies, all of us. Oh, I can't wait for that. Amen. Oh, praise God. You know what Jesus did on that cross? That's why we sing, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Amen. Shout it out. Jesus saves. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Jesus saves. He's the answer. Amen. And it's because what? He's going to save us from sin's presence. We'll never be tempted again. Oh, praise God. Amen, with that new body, and with the Lord, no more. Amen, no more struggles, no more challenges. Amen, oh, I can't wait for that day. Oh, so listen, God wants to work in you when he saves you, amen, and he does it, and he's done it already in your life, and you, some of you don't even realize what he is doing, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he yet will do for us in the future. It might not be a lot of money and a lot of th big things and material possessions, but he's doing a lot for us in the spiritual realm. He's preparing you for eternity. It would be good. Well, it would serve us well if we would just spend more time with God. Amen. So the second thing, God not only works in you when he saves you, but God works through you when he sends you. Amen. You know what? The Bible tells us, look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we probably, I don't know if we're coming back to Ephesians 2. I don't think we're coming back to Ephesians 2. So you can get rid, you can let go of that passage if you're still got your fingers in there or a marker in there. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And look at this. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And look at verse, let's see here, get my place here. John chapter 20. And look at verse 20. Uh, how about verse 19? And the same day, so the first time when Jesus appears, it's on a Sunday night. They had a Sunday night service. And then what happened was they were all there except for Thomas. Thomas was, was absent that night. He missed out on that Sunday night service together with the other disciples there, the other apostles. And so anyway, the same day at evening, the Bible says, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. People were full of fear. You think, oh, pastor, I'm full of a fear today in 2024. This is not a new emotion. You know what? These people were afraid because they were thinking, are they going to seek out any one of us? Crucify us. Amen. Because they're followers of Jesus Christ. Amen. Like in some countries around the world, especially in that 1040 window. And he says unto them, he stood in the midst, the door was shut, he walks, he, come, he appears right there. Long time before Star Trek came up with all of that, beam me up Scotty stuff, and here all of a sudden you appear somewhere. He was right there, the door's being shut, this didn't matter, he could appear right in our presence. 
and not have to open a door. He can do that. By the way, he created matter. The Bible says in Colossians, by, all things, by him all things consist. He keeps it going. He keeps the atoms. He keeps the molecules together. Amen. Those things get all messed up and start falling apart. We're just a pile of atoms. This wall, everything. God keeps you alive. Amen. So he gets through there, and he's there with them. All of a sudden, he says, peace be unto you. Amen. Stop worrying about stuff. Don't be full of fear. Peace, peace. Amen. And he says this in verse 20. When he had said, so said, he showed them unto, his, unto them his hands and his side. And then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. They didn't realize. They couldn't tell in his glorified state that this was Jesus. He looked different. They couldn't tell. They didn't recognize him. And they said, look at my hands. Oh, oh, it's you, Jesus. It's you. Amen. Praise God. Oh, praise the Lord. And then verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. You know what? God not only gave Jesus Christ a commission to come to, to, from heaven, amen, to earth. I love that song. Havergal wrote, I gave my life for thee. Amen. He came from heaven's glory, came down to this dark world that we live in. Amen. And he lived a life, a perfect sinless life. Amen. And, and he, he never sinned once. And he took your sin. He took my sin. I deserve to die for my sins. He took my sins on the cross. He paid for them in full. Amen. That's what he did. And you know what? But he said, now I got something for you to do. Amen? It's not just for us enough to say, thank you, Lord, I'm saved. That's important. But what's more is God's given you something to do. Can you open your mouth for Jesus and share the gospel? I got gospel tracts. Oh, it bothered me yesterday. My wife went out with some other ladies, and she wanted to give a, a track to the the, um, the wait waitress where she was, and I gave out all my tracks. When I was by that falls, I gave some people some tracks. And when I was in the hospital, I gave people tracks. And you know what? Hey, listen. Hey, listen. You can give out tracks if you want to, if you're saved. What are you afraid of? Don't be ashamed. Hey, man, we got more tracks. I need help stamping some tracks back there. I got to grab a bunch more. Are you thinking about the opportunities? We're so busy. I got to go here. I got to go there. Oh, I got to hurry up and go and do this and do that. And you're missing all these people in between. I got to make this on time. I got to do this on this time. Listen, I'm not for anybody being late, but listen, I'll tell you something right now. Amen. If you came to church late on Sunday morning because you were giving the gospel to someone, hey, listen, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Amen. I want you here, but you know what? If you're telling someone about Jesus, by the way, you got all the rest of the week to tell people about Jesus too, you know. Yeah. Don't save it for Sunday morning. Yeah. Share it Sundays. Well, I'm going to church. I don't need to, you know, like some people think, I, I'm, I don't need to read my Bible today. The pastor's going to, you know, teach to me and preach and fill me, you know, and, and feed me the Word of God. Hey, Amen. I hope I do, but you need more than that. If you only ate once a week physically, you would be a wreck. But we seem fine with feeding ourselves once a week, bringing your Bible to church, maybe not opening up all week long. You're not going to get very far. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hey, he says, as much as you say, well, I got, listen, your stomach right now, and that clock's wrong, I need a battery, I got to get a battery or change that thing, and downstairs, I need a battery down there. But you know what? Uh, you look at that clock, and right now, we're on the old time. Hey, that'd be good. I got an extra hour or so to preach. Amen. We'll leave that clock up right now. Amen. No, I won't do that to you. Anyway, but it's getting close to noon. You're probably, oh, the tummy, you know, I just... You know, I got to eat something. I just, I'm hungry. I'm starving. Okay, wait, hold that word starving, but that's not a word you want to throw around because if you haven't seen people starving, you aren't starving. You aren't starving, and I'm not starving. Amen. But you know what? Listen, are you, are you going to share the word with somebody? Man, we, we got to go. We got to do this. We got to do that. Amen. I'm not, listen, I keep myself busy. I don't have enough time in the day to do all the things I'd like to do. Amen. I wish I had more time, but God gives me 24 hours just like you. And I got to get some rest because I'm not going to get, I'm going to get sick if I burn the candle at both ends. Amen. So you know what? I just say, God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what was done. 
Amen. Praise God. So anyway, so he wants to send you. He sends you through a commission. Jesus, you know, we, we did the Great Commission in our, our Life of Christ study. We looked at Matthew 28 and Mark 16 and Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1. We went through all those passages on Wednesday night. Amen. The boy, I tell you, he says, hey, preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. That kind of counts everybody in. Amen. Every creature. How about that? And you know what? That's what God wants us to do. That's what God wants us to do. Look at John 17. You're over in John 20. Go to John 17, verse 18. Oh, this is a beautiful chapter. I love this chapter. We preached it on the Wednesday night series of Life of Christ. This is a prayer of intercession by Jesus Christ. He's praying. He's praying. In verse 1, he says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Amen. He prayed. You want to find the Lord's prayer? It's right here. He truly prayed this one. The other one he gave us a pattern prayer. It wasn't one that he prayed because he never had any debts or sins. Father, forgive me for my sins. Really? Jesus didn't have any sin. He never prayed that prayer. He gave it a pattern for you and I who are sinners in need of, of a Savior and of, and, and of salvation. Right. Amen. That's a pattern. And God's, God, Jesus Christ gave us, but this is his prayer. He's praying this. This is also similar to what Christ is probably praying in heaven as he's interceding for us. He's praying for you. He's praying for you. Amen. Oh, praise God. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you. Do we understand? So in this passage, look at this. The Bible says over there in verse, uh, let's see here, verse uh, 18, I think it is. The Bible says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Oh, oh, has, have you forgotten that? You know what? God wants to work in you when he saves you, if you let him. Amen. And he has already done in your heart and your soul, but can you allow, allow him the rest of the way? And not only number two, God wants to work through you when he sends you. You know, he sends people. You know, thank God for missionaries that follow the call of God. Amen. They go to different places. You know, God's blessed so much. Uh, the church in, in Canada, we got people from all over the world here in this country. Amen. This dear couple from Guatemala. Amen. We got Chile over here. We got the Philippines. Amen. Praise God. We got Nigeria. We got Jamaica. Amen. Listen, listen, listen. God's doing something. I'm not against missions. We still need to send missionaries out. Amen. Boy, I tell you, I'm waiting for that day where we can send somebody out that God's called to preach and that God has called and prepared them for the ministry that we can send them out. Amen. To go preach. Amen. And support them. That's what I want to see God do. Because that's what God wants. I remember Brother Osteen say churches should reproduce churches. Christians should reproduce Christians. How's it coming? Amen. You're responsible for that part. But if God's called you to do something, you better get your you better get your heart in the right place and get prepared. Amen. God wants to do something with you. Now I'm trying starting to scare you. Look at Isaiah 6 8, and we'll move on to the third point. Isaiah, I love this passage. Oh, this is a part. You say that a lot. It's like all these verses. I love this. And I yeah, amen. I do. I know. Amen. No matter where you turn, it's all good. By the way, you can read any verse in the Bible and it's good. You think, oh, that's a really good path. I know, we all say that. I've said it. I've said it just now, and I'll, we all say it. But reality is, you can pick the Bible, open up anywhere. It's God's Word everywhere. From Genesis to Revelation, it's God's Word. It's important. It's truth. And God wants you to read it and ask God to help you understand it. Amen. So Isaiah 6, here's, here's Isaiah's having this vision. Okay, and what happened was, the Bible says in verse 1 of Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died... You know what? The Bible tell, leads us to believe this, that Isaiah was a bit down in the dumps. Because I, Uzziah, he died. King Uzziah died. And you know what? When you have a good leader, you don't want them to die. Right. Amen? Well, when there's a wicked leader, it's not that you wish them to die. Because, by the way, the Bible tells us that God doesn't get pleasure in the death of the wicked. Don't ever forget that. Amen? But the reality is you say, boy, Lord, why do we have that? Maybe it's because we need that kind of leader in our country or in any country. Whatever leadership that we have, we have. 
God's allowed it to happen. Amen? So you know what? You say, that's making it, me, making it hard for me to serve God. Maybe you need to face some trials and tribulations in serving God. Because that's what most Christians have done down through the centuries. We want it easy to serve God, easy to preach, easy to get the word out, easy to share the gospel. Why, why? That's, that's, listen, we've had it good for years. What's taken us so long to take advantage of that? Now we're saying, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. We'll really find out who are truly committed to the cause of Jesus Christ if things ever change in our country, Canada. Amen. They're working on stuff in the parliament. Amen. I won't get political. I'm holding back. I'm holding back on that one. There's things that are changing to restrict your freedoms for, they call it, religious texts. That's what's going on. Be open your eyes. Listen, listen, I don't hate anybody, but I believe we ought to speak the truth in love. We got to get the truth out. Who's going to do it? If you rely on me, the, if I'm the only one getting the truth, and I'm not saying I am, we're going to be in sorry shape here. If you don't catch the vision, this church will die. I guarantee you, it'll die. I don't know about you. I don't want to see Ichabod on the door here. Amen. I'm, that's, listen, you got, to get, you got to see the vision here. Well, Isaiah got the vision. He was a little bit down because King Uzziah died. And then the Lord had to show him something. He said he saw the Lord on his throne. Maybe some of you got to look up more. You see God on his throne? You may not see him in, in, with your, these eyes, but you got it in the word. He's on his throne right now. Have you forgotten that? And then the Bible says, it goes in all this description, amazing thing. After God shows him all this, verse 5, then, he, then Isaiah says this, Whoa, it's me. I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. He said, Listen, if you see God the way God wants you to see him, you'll realize, Lord God, it's your mercy and your grace that I'm even saved, Lord. I'm not worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Amen. If you, the problem is we don't see God the way we should. Isaiah saw him. He said, man, I'm undone. A prophet of God, a godly man says, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And he said, I dwell in the midst, verse 5, of people of unclean lips. You think, oh, you're all alone. You're as a Christian. Boy, it's so hard to live for God and serve God. Read your Bible. Read history. Read, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read Martyr's Mirrors. Look those up if you don't know where, if you've never read them. Maybe you need to download a Kindle version if you're into that digital stuff. Hey, listen, people have been suffering for thousands of years for the cause of God and Jesus Christ. So when it was all done and said, he then at verse 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Notice the plurality there. That's the same in the book of Genesis. Yeah, right. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. One God, three persons. Yeah. He says, who, who, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah, after he saw himself like the way God wanted him to, to see himself, and he had that vision of God, he says, here am I, send me. How about you today? How about you today? What's holding you back from allowing God to use you to talk to the people that I will never probably meet in your life? There's people I cross paths with that you don't, and there's people you cross paths with that I don't. What's going to happen to those people if you don't share the word? Amen. Oh, we ought to open our mouths. God wants to work through you in sending you and, and helping you to share the word of God and the gospel to people. Amen. Oh, not only does God work in you when he saves you and through you when he sends you, but also look at Jeremiah 18. If you know your Bible, you know what this, this chapter is about. Amen. I have a video from uh, um, Radio Bible Class. I don't know if I still have it. I used to have it. You can probably find it online. If you want the link, it'll talk all about the potter and the clay. It talks about this guy who's a pottery guy in Colorado, in Colorado Springs. I used to live in Denver, and I visited all those places through the Rocky Mountains and all that when I was young. 
And uh, so he goes through the whole explanation and he takes this chapter and he, he brings out so much truth from this chapter. And if you open your Bible to chapter 18 and you follow that video, you will learn so much about the potter and the clay. And it'll help you. Amen. So watch this here. Look at the Bible says. Verse 1. Amen. So well, first, God works in you when he saves you. God works through you when he sends you. But now God works on you when he sanctifies you. God's trying to work on you right now. Amen. Now watch this. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. And I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. The wheels, you'll find out, is like a picture of life. Yeah. Amen. It's just going, we're going around. 24 hours a day, the earth spins. Amen. Here we are. Another day. Another day. Tomorrow, another day. After midnight. Amen. And life just goes on. And then, then he said, I went down to the potter's house. Behold, the wrought work on the wheels. Verse 4. And the vessel that he made on the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. So what you have here is we are, the Bible teaches, we are the clay. God is the potter. Now, we've got to get that right because some of us, some of God's people think they're the potter. No, 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 no. You are the clay. <coughs> you need to submit yourself to God. And when you don't, the clay gets marred when you resist God. And God's trying to mold you. The Bible says in Romans 8, he's trying to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. And we fight God and things. Amen. Why are we fighting God? You'll never win with him. You'll never win. Amen. Just, I'll beat God on this one. No, you won't. He always wins. So we resist the will of God. We resist what God wants to do in our heart and our life. We resist and resist and resist. Amen. Even as Stephen was preaching, ye resist the Holy Ghost, he told the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees. As they, were, as they were about to stone him in Acts chapter 7, resisting God. Wow. And he says, I'll make it again. Okay, you're not following me. Let me try this again. He's got to put it down on that wheel and, and while it's still moldable. But you know what happens if it goes too long? It's like a picture of your heart. Your heart gets hard now. Oh, is your heart hard now? What is it? What's, what's going on in your life? Have you gotten to that stage? I hope not. I hope not. I hope you're still moldable. Amen. Amen. He's the potter. You're the clay. Would you keep on? Come on. Stay. Listen. D deal with it. Take care of it. Whatever it is that's stopping you, keeping you from being what you ought to be for Jesus Christ. What is it? I don't know what it is with you, but you know your own heart. There's some things you know you need to deal with and take care of, but we're just fighting God all the way. Yeah. Why? Doesn't make any sense. Oh, so what happens here? Then the Bible says here, and then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, This is the sign of the potter's house. O house Israel, cannot I do with you as with this potter? Saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. He says, you're in my hands. And we'll talk about that down on the next point. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. And you know what? Sometimes there's a time, there is a time where people fight and fight and fight and fight. And the Bible teaches that even in the New Testament, there were some at the Lord's table where the Lord said, many are weak. And some um, are their sickness, their uh, weakness, sickness, and even death or sleep, the Bible says. Sleep is, again, a term that God uses for those who are saved that die. Their, their body's asleep, but their soul and spirit's with the Lord. The Bible says for the rapture, hey, those that are asleep in Jesus Christ, he'll raise them up. Amen. And take them up with the Lord with us, as I've already said earlier. And sometimes we get hard. Even as Ananias and Sapphira, who made a promise, and God knew their promise, but they told people, hey, we're going to sell this land, the price of the land. We're going to give it all to God. God never told them to give it all, but they said they were. And when they, the question was asked, and Peter asked them the question, did you give it all to the Lord? And he said, yes, I did. And you know what God did? Killed them right there. 
Can you imagine if God was doing that in the local church city? I'm not saying he doesn't, but I haven't seen that happen yet. But I don't believe it. I, don't, um, I wouldn't say it couldn't happen. Sometimes we get so useless. You're saved. But what's going on in your life? What's keeping you from what you ought to be? So you know what you have to do? The Bible says, look at this. Man, I'll tell you. The Bible says here in verse 1 of chapter 19. Get to chapter 19. Thus saith the Lord, go and get the potter. Potter's earthen bottle. Take, take of the ancients of the people and the ancients of the priests and go forth unto the valley of son of Hinnon, which is by the entry of the east gate, and proclaim there the words that I shall tell thee and say, hear, hear, hear. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, inhabitants of Israel. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place. The which whosoever heareth, his ears shall tingle, because they have forsaken me and have estranged this place, and have burned incense in it to other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and have filled the place with the blood of innocence. And they have built also the places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came into it, uh, it into my mind. By the way, we think, oh, we're not like them because we're not offering our kids to, to these false gods. Let me tell you something. You've heard me say it. I'll say it again. If you honor anyone, including your own children, above God, before God, they are your idol. Anything, any material possession you put before God. Amen. Anything, any person, anything you put them before God or above God, they're an idol. We are no more different than the Old Testament saints when we look at this. Well, that's not me. We excuse ourselves. We stand back. Well, that's not me. I'm glad I'm not them when we're more like them than we want to admit. Oh, I'm telling you. You know what happens in this chapter? He throws the pottery down. He smashes it. He smashes it. You know, the Bible even talks about New Testament when he talks about a cutting of a tree. Amen? It's a, it's a picture of taking someone home. The Bible even says that, that man that was, Jesus was trying to you know, heal the blindness, and he said, what do you see? He says, I see men as trees. And the Bible uses that illustration of that throughout the New Testament. It talks about we're like a tree, and when he, and if you don't want to listen to God and obey God, he's going to cut it down. The roots are still there. He's just going to top it off. Man, I'll tell you, I don't want to be in that place. I don't want to be in that place. Man, I'll tell you. But you know what? Let me say two things on this, and we'll move to point four. So God works on you when he sanctifies. How does he sanctify us? What does the word sanctify mean? It means to set you apart for him. Yeah. Amen. But we read in Sunday school, we were children of disobedience, children of wrath. Bible says in John 8, 44, before you were saved, you were a child of the devil. Yeah. That's what Jesus said. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. If you're not saved and not born again, amen, you're a child of the devil. It's like, whoa, that's pretty rough stuff. Yeah, I think we better get a better glimpse of how Jesus really said things and what he said. Because I think some of us have softened Jesus down. you got to read the whole Bible, especially the New Testament Gospels. You'll see what Jesus said. Amen. And then he, so anyway, so number one, how does he work on us? How does he sanctify us? He does it through the truth. This book is truth. The word is true. Amen. Every bit of it. The Bible says in John 17, 17, you want to jot it down? I won't go. Turn to it. I got it in my notes here. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word is truth. God wants to set you apart. The degree of being sanctified depends on how much time you expose yourself to the word of God. No daily devotions, not much time in the Word of God. You aren't being sanctified like you should be. Right. You're not. You're not. It's through the Word of God. He says in John 15, 3, on that whole thing about he's the vine, we're the branches. In verse 3, he says, now you're clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. This book will clean you up. The book of James says it's like looking in a mirror. You'll say, oh, I'm beginning to see myself like I should see myself. Because God says some things, and God the Holy Spirit, if you're saved, will work in your heart and say, you better take care of that. 
You think just because someone else hasn't found out that you're not in a good place, that I don't know about it? God knows everything. Amen. What doesn't he know? Wow. Psalm 19, verse 9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word. Hey, someone said this. Not that you disrespect your Bible and rip it to pieces and all that, but a dirty Bible, probably a clean heart. Yeah. A clean Bible hardly ever used is probably a dirty heart. You don't read your Bible. You say, well, we're in the electronic age. Whatever. Try to apply that. That's all I can say to you. Yeah. Amen. When I was talking to the girls here on the other day, and uh, Marsha got saved. Amen. Praise God. I don't know if she's watching this morning. God bless you. Amen. Tears flowing. Amen. We're talking about Bible. It says you need to have devotions with God. You need to spend time with God every day. Whatever works for you. And I said, you know, if you got technology, you know, you got to be careful. And, and, and that stuff will probably distract you. You know, you get a notification. Next thing you know, it, you're an hour on social media or watching a YouTube video. And you already forgot about why you, you were, had your so-called U version up. I'm not knocking U version. It's a, great, it's a great app. But if you don't turn stuff off, you're going to get so distracted. Right. You're going to get so distracted, you won't finish. It'll take you a couple of hours to get through a few verses because of all the notifications. And they said, you know what, Pastor? I said, you got a Bible? She said, yes, I do. I said, you know what? You need a devotional. That's what you need. Now, Brother Gary gets them every couple of months. And if you don't get them, listen, you can get you use whatever you want, okay? But there are devotions out there, devotionals in print form. The famous one, of course, is Daily Bread. It's been around for ages, amen? And anyway, so, but you need a print version if you're distracted easily. Amen. You need something like this. Amen. Praise God. So he works on us through the truth. And are you ready for this one? I know it's not. Well, Pastor, oh, Pastor, why do you got to do this to me? Amen. I love you. I love you. That's why. Amen. James chapter 1. Listen, I, I, you know, some people think I just enjoy tribulations and trials. <laughs> Technically, spiritually, we can get to a level. I mean, the Bible tells in the book of Acts, the apostles, when they were beaten and everything, they counted it worthy. They said, we're, we were counted. We suffered shame for his name. We just, wow, what a blessing. <laughs> I'm not there yet. I probably disappointed you when I just said that. I'm not there yet. Paul said, you know, Lord, why do I got this thorn in the flesh? And he asked the Lord three times to take it away. God didn't take it away. And he realized, he said, so you know what? Uh, bring on the dis distresses and persecutions, Lord. Because he says he wanted the power of Christ to rest upon him. And he realized the principle in the Bible, when you're weak, God, hey, you can be strong in God. Right. Promise, we're too strong in self. That's why we're not recipients of God's strength. Yeah, right. We're living life without God, even though we have him in our heart. It's sad when we live that way. James chapter 1. Again, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I'm, someone's got to be the messenger for the message, and I am, and I want to live this, these truths, everything I've said so far, including this. Verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy. Come on. When you fall into divers temptations, I'm not talking about someone diving in the ocean, eh? That's just talking about all kinds of different types of temptations coming your way. Knowing this, that the trine of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work. We don't want patience to take place. God says, let it take place. Amen. God, get me out. No, God will get you through. He's not obligated to get you out of the trial. Amen. And the testing, but he'll get you through it. You don't know, Pastor, what I, I know I don't, but I know the book. 
That's what God promises. He'll get you through it. What are you struggling with? What do you have? What's a trial you're going through? God will get you through it. If you just let him help you. He says, well, let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. Oh, look at Romans chapter 5. I know. I got too much to say here. I know. I got lots to say. Romans 5. Romans 5. Amen. Are you letting God, listen, are you saved today? God wants to work in you. He wants to begin that work. Has it begun yet? If you're not saved, come. Uh, we'll have an altar call soon. If you say, I'm embarrassed, you shouldn't be, but hey, come on. Don't be afraid. You say, well, I can't do that. Well, come see me. We'll open the Bible with you. you say, well, maybe everybody's in a hurry to go home. I'm not. I'm not. What's that song the girls sing? Only one soul. One soul. I'm in no hurry. I hope you aren't. Would you wait here while someone's being led to Christ? Or you say, well, we got to go. I got to go. I understand if you got to go because you got to appoint, you got to, your, your job and your shift work. I understand that. But the rest of you, do you have to? Yeah. Hey, Amen. God wants to work through you when he sends you. He wants to use you today. God works on you when he sanctifies you, and that's what we're on. And Romans 5, again, this is rough stuff. This is really, really, really rough. The Bible says, therefore, verse 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace whereon we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now watch this. Verse 3, are you ready for the rough stuff here? Look at this. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. I'm not there yet. Bring it on, Lord. Not there yet. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. What else? And patience. What does it work? Experience. And experience, what does that work? Hope. And where's verse 5? And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. God says the love of God's inside of there. And when you're going through stuff, can you honestly say, hey, I have a great God. I'm going through a lot, but I love my God. I love my Savior. What do we do half the time? We turn away from God. That's it. I'm done with this thing. Amen. Amen. You know what, people in the world, they want to see your faith in action. They don't want to hear you talk about it. Show me your faith. That's what James talks about. Show me your faith today. Amen. You say you're saved, show me your faith. Show the world your faith. Just live it out. You don't brag about it and say how great you are. You just live your faith. They ought to see something different. If they don't, you say, well, listen, I'm going to heaven. They don't know that. Maybe you tried to tell them. But maybe they're saying, you think, I don't know if you're really a Christian or not. If they have a hard time ex looking at you and deciding whether you're a Christian or not, you got some problems that you got to deal with. We're not supposed to be ashamed. Amen. So watch this. And then, so in this passage, again, it's God wants to work on you through the truth and through trials. I know you don't want that. I know most of us don't say, sign me up, Lord. <laughs> no, no, no. Last of all, got to wrap up. You've heard enough. Amen. God will work for you when he sees you. And he sees you all the time. You ready? Look at, look at Matthew chapter 6. And we're wrapping up. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. You know, God loves you. He cares for you. But real life is allowing things to happen. God didn't bring sorrow into the world. Man did by their disobedience. And God says, because of that, here's sorrow. I didn't sign up for that, Lord. Too bad. You did when you disobeyed. The one and only commandment to follow. I can follow ten. They couldn't follow one. Who do we think we are? People say, well, I follow the Ten Commandments. Really? No one has, except for Jesus Christ. No one was sinless. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. Are you there? You're waiting on me. Watch this. 
Matthew chapter 6. Where am I here? Oh, good. So Jesus talks about, verse 19, lay, up, lay not up your, for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Verse 20, but lay up your, for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break in nor steal. Yeah, you know what? A thief can't get, get what you have that's in heaven. Some, Jesus is basically saying, where's your treasure? Here or up there? Are you going to your treasures when you die, or are you leaving all your treasures? The treasures in heaven are spiritual things. We got a lot of material things down here. And he says this, verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How do you find out whether someone, where their heart is? Look at their bank statement. Look at your bank statement. How much did you give to God? You're spending all this money on everything else. Is God in there at all? We don't even think about God? Amen. You say, it's rough. I make sure I give God his part first. Amen. Are you? Praise God. You know what? He says, where's your heart? And then he go down to verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one, love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's money, material things. You can't serve both. It's one or the other. Watch this now. Here's where I'm... You say, well, God doesn't care for me. Then you don't read the Bible. He cares for you. He loves you and he cares for you. Therefore, because of what he just said, that's what the therefore is there for, okay? I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. So, eating, drinking, and clothing. You mean, say, God's against me having a roof over my head? No. But he says, what, what if all you had was food and drink and clothing? Would you be content? The Bible says this in other places, even in Paul's letter to Timothy, food and raiment. Well, I want a roof over my head. God's not against you having a roof over your head. But if you can learn to be content with food and clothing, you can be content with a lot less than you are now. Well, I got to have this. Oh, I better buy that on Amazon. Yeah, click, click, click. Yeah, automatic. Did you really need it? What are we doing? Amen. What are we doing? He says this. Is not life more than meat and the body than raiment? What's life? It's not about that. We need those. Those are like basic necessity. But God says, you're worrying about stuff that I'm going to take care of you. It may not be to the degree that you would like, but God will take care of you. Watch this. Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they rape, nor gather into the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? God says, aren't you better than a bird? What's the answer to that question? Yes. It's a rhetorical question. We know the answer to it. Yes, you're better than an animal. We are the crowning of God's creation, mankind. You know what we have in Romans 1? It says people are worshiping the, cre the, cre uh, the, the, the creature more than the creator. Yeah. I'm not for the mistreatment of animals. The Bible tells in the Old Testament, if you have a beast, that you're supposed to take care of your beast. Right. That's what it says. Yeah. Amen? If you've got a, a pet or animal, you take care of it. But we don't worship the animal kingdom. That's, that's worldly philosophy. People, Colossians 2.8, people have been spoiled through vain philosophy and deceit. We don't mistreat them, but we don't worship them. That's the problem. God says, you're better than the birds. How about that? What does God do? He feeds them. Amen. He feeds them. Look at another passage. I know we got to wrap up here. Chapter 12, verse 12. Look at this. Chapter 12, verse 12 of Matthew. You're better than the birds. How much then is a man better than a sheep? You're better than sheep. 
You're better than a bird. Need I go any further from the words of Jesus Christ? Do we believe Jesus Christ's words or no? Are we ignoring those words? Mankind is better than the animal kingdom. And again, that's not a statement to mistreat the animal kingdom. But we have elevated the animal kingdom above mankind. We've actually relegated animal kingdom, put them on the same, same plane. You're just an animal, an evolutionary accident. You came from nothing. Those are the statements and words that the world uses in evolution. That's basically what it is. An accident over billions of years? Impossible. This eye could not have ever evolved. There's parts of your body, if they, everything wasn't in working order instantaneously, it would never have worked. But yet we'll believe a lie rather than the truth. That's what the world's teaching out there. And we'd rather believe that. How about that? That's pretty sad. So you know what, God, he's saying something to you really clearly, and i got to wrap up. He said, I love you, and I want to take care of you. And he wants to work for you. I want to take care of your basic needs, if we can identify them properly. He said, God's, God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's your need. God defines that word, not you. We've been defining our own definition of needs. I need this, I need this, I need... Oh, I just saw that on the billboard. I saw that on that millionth commercial on TV or on YouTube. I got to buy that. No, you don't. So God perceives our situation. He knows your situation today. God prefers us above all of his creation. We're the crowning of his creation. Amen, everything. The plants, the animals, everything. Man, God created man to have dominion over this earth, and he messed up in the garden. That's what happened. And God protects us. Amen. He takes care of us. That's God. He works for you. He works for you when you're sleeping. You don't even realize. Amen. Oh, we serve a great God. He's a good God. He's a good father. Amen. Oh, he's an amazing God. Oh, I thank God. Oh, listen today. God works in you when he saves you. He works through you when he sends you. He works on you when he sanctifies you. And he works for you when he sees you. And he sees you all the time. Let's all stand. We'll close in prayer today.